the end of one of the most exciting winters in years on the goaltending front. The net mining world takes a breath before the draft and NHL free agency. Hello, goaltenders. And those who are doing your best impression of being a fly in the wall. I'm Darren Millard, and this is In Goal Radio, the podcast presented by The Hockey Shop. Source for sports, Surrey, thehockeyshop.com. Those people out at The Hockey Shop, Right now, in the backyard as the hockey world gathers at Rogers Arena for the 2019 NHL Draft. Today, a man that could quite possibly be the first goaltender selected will make his in-goal radio debut as Spencer Knight spends some time with us. We will dispatch Woody to the hockey shop for the gear segment where our buddy Cam spends some time on an area that is overdue for a visit. The Chesty, plus listener questions, at least one listener question that uh, that you, you probably want to stick around for because it's uh, it's of real value to me. Uh, I'll be in Vancouver attending the draft proceedings where we're expecting plenty of news outside of the selections, plus a chance to connect with the founders of InGoal Magazine, David Hutchison, Kevin Woodley, in person. Looking forward to seeing you guys again. We've booked some great conversations uh, over the course of the next few days that we will bring the listeners in the next couple of weeks. Uh, Woody, Hutch? Uh, this is a, a great time, third time for Vancouver with the NHL draft, uh, going to Rogers Arena this time around. It's, it's going to be fun. I got to say, last time brings back some memories because the last time the draft was here, I was working for the Associated Press and Roberto Luongo acquired by the Vancouver Canucks during the draft weekend. So that was that was kind of a big step, um, obviously, for the best goaltender in the history of the Canucks. So big step for the market here. Uh, big step for me because he was a guy that I knew already from Florida. So having him come into my backyard, you know, frankly built a relationship there and I was excited for it. So we'll see what, what awaits us this year at the draft. I'm looking forward to one quick thing though, Darren, is it for us, is it fly on the wall or should it be butterfly on the wall? Oh, Ooh. oh, that, that much, much better. That's why I should send my intros by you and have you look at them. But butterfly, yeah, way, way better. Uh, well done. My new catchphrase. I don't know what it's Ron worth, McLean, but there we eat go. your heart out. Yeah. Hutch, what's happening? Uh, not too much. I'm excited about this weekend. It's going to be a lot of fun to get the team together. Uh, it sounds like a, a lot of chatter out there about player movement too. So it could be a, a fun weekend at the draft. We happen to know a few of the folks that are fairly highly ranked to go as well. So uh, it's going to be a great weekend. Have you ever? attended a draft before hutch i have never attended a draft before Ooh, mm. this is your yeah, yeah this will be good this will be good for hutch. <laughs> it's uh it's fun times now darren one other thing to correct on the uh on the intro i'm pretty confident we can say spencer wow. knight's gonna be first the first goalie off yeah. the board i know I always, you never know I always hesitate I always hesitate. Uh, Va- Vancouver's got a great history uh, w- with the draft. You mentioned the Luongo part. Uh, BC Place hosted it the first time that they they held a draft, so that was really unique. Uh, so there's uh, there's some history there. And uh, Corey Schneider being traded uh, at the draft when it was in New Jersey. So yeah, there's uh, there's a lot of moving parts. Uh, Jordan Bennington was drafted back in 2011 when the draft was held in St. Paul. And uh, just a, a few years later, uh, eight years later, he is a Stanley Cup champion. Uh, Hutch, uh, just where are we in, in the, the annals of history for Jordan Bennington being on top of the hockey world right now? Well, and the only rookie goaltender ever to win 16 games in a playoff series. So that's really exciting. You know, for me, uh, what was really exciting was he's the coolest customer on the planet uh, when it's business time. But now that it's over, uh, is there anybody having more fun than Jordan Bennington? I love uh, yeah, Brett Hall. Bike. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. That's true. I love the ride on the mini bike, though. That was to me, that was the highlight when he hopped on the motorbike on the parade. And took the first <laughs> for sure. Yeah. Sweet. For sure. And, and I don't know if you heard him. Don't know who the reporter was, but was asking about the uh, about the Calder, and Bennington just looked him square in the eyes and said, "Well, who did you vote for?" Nice to uh, nice to see a little playback. Yeah, turn it around. Yeah, turn it I, around. I don't see. I don't see Vegas and Jordan Bennington going hand in hand. Like he's he's probably the the one guy that that would be in his route when you look at him. But uh, but he's got a real fire uh, fiery side to him. Like when when things go sideways, uh, the game's out of reach. He can hack. He can whack. He can he can get intense. He can he can uh, he can get in your face. I, I I like the way he he handles himself and 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 really sort of picks his spots. I, that's not necessarily the way to go about 
I'm not every coach would like that, but but I appreciate that part. Do you want to know the one thing as we head into the draft weekend that Jordan Bennington yeah. can't do? What? He couldn't have been picked by his hometown Toronto Maple Leafs because they would never have even allowed their scouts to submit a report. On six foot one, Jordan Bennington. The cutoff for that organization is six foot two. So we've had this conversation before about height, uh, about w- what really matters. But it's kind of interesting heading into this weekend, Darren, and we can talk to scouts when we're there and talk to some of the various people involved. But you know, a little surprised to learn that six two is a cutoff. We used to think six feet, and I thought, you know, okay, I get it. But to have six two is a hard and fast rule when we look at the success a guy like Jordan Bennington just had. Um, you know, that leaves me scratching my head a little bit. I got to be honest with you. The tallest goaltender to win the Stanley Cup as a starter had a height of six foot four. Gentlemen, L- let's not say, right. should we maybe not even say who it is? You brought up that brilliant question the other night. Should we leave that for, uh, for the comments or something? And, and, and this discussion came about just an organic night when uh, we were out for Tendy Fest and we were hanging out with uh, Eli Wilson yep. and, and Hutch and, and Woody and we were just uh, just shooting the breeze and we were talking about height and, and we started throwing around like, what's the tallest goaltender to ever win the Stanley Cup as a starter? And uh, as far as we've been able to research, two guys, uh, two different guys at... Uh, Slightly different eras. Yeah. I, Six foot four. Yeah, we'll we'll leave it there and uh, send us your comments through social media and and give us an, an idea of uh, of who you think well, it is. Hey, but six foot two is the cutoff for Toronto, which is interesting. Yeah, and so Bennington doesn't get drafted there. And hey, um, while you're at it, listeners, you can tell us the same answer to the same question tonight. The Vesna Trophy is going to be handed out. Um, same rules apply. Uh, outside of Pekarine at six foot five. Uh, there's only one other goaltender at six foot four or above that has ever won it. So give us that one. It's hint, hint. It's the same name as uh, one of the names of the other questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, well played. That every time uh, we start doing this thing, we start rattling things around. My head starts spinning. But uh, uh, Woody, you are uh, you're headed out to the hockey shop uh, to spend some time with Cam, and uh, things are in full off season mode, which means uh, on season really uh, for for those people at the hockey shop and Source for Sports. Yeah, we got out there uh, early because you're right; it does get busy. So actually, my segment this week, instead of having to slip into the back, we actually got out there before they opened. Uh, managed to get a few moments in with Cam before the public arrived on mass. And once they did, it got a little loud in the background. So I was glad I was able to get that time. Um, there's a reason people flock to the hockey shop. Uh, it's because here in the lower mainland, they're simply the best, especially when it comes to goaltending. And I call it goalie heaven. Every time we uh, intro Cam, it really is. Uh, the entire lower floor, the basement, for lack of a better term, is just walls of goaltending gear. The latest and greatest in pads and gloves, skates, masks, uh, you name it. But what I love is they also have great accessories. We've talked about that over the past couple episodes. Uh, custom custom blades, custom steel, custom radius sharpenings just to fit your specific desires in terms of pitch and angle and the way you like to play. Um, the ability, a staff that understands how to get you custom orders, whether it's the latest from CCM, Bauer, Bryans, Warrior, Vaughn, um, everything they have in stock, plus the ability to get you your exact specs and a staff that understands what those specs, not only how they work, um, but how they're going to match your game. So that's the reason I go to Hockey Shop, Source for Sports in Surrey. And if you're not lucky enough like me to live in the Vancouver area, and it really is God's country, um, you can check them out at thehockeyshop.com. Uh, like I said, the Hockey Shop, there's a reason. They, 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 uh, there's a reason we picked them to help sponsor this podcast because they really do understand the position. They live it. They breathe it. Um, and kind of like us, they're, they're, they're goalie geeks. So where else would you want to buy your gear from? The Bauer Chesty is the uh, subject today, and the the Chesty could be the most challenging piece of equipment for Cam and uh, and Woody to to break down while holding a microphone and and wearing a Chesty. So <laughs> I I wish we had video of that Ooh, thing. That, that would have been a, that would have been a good idea. Yeah. And, uh, interestingly <laughs> enough, I will say the Bauer Two X Pro is one of the units where you could pull it off the rack, out of the box, off the rack, put it on, grab a microphone, yeah. hold it up to your chin, and have no problem having that conversation. That's a really good idea, Darren. I wish I'd thought of that. Oh, I don't know, a couple hours ago? 
Yeah, you know what? Uh, between uh, me and the the butterfly uh, uh, on the wall, and uh, and now this, we 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 should really we should really have a discussion before we go on the air. Uh, Spencer Knight is our feature interview for this episode. He's part of the stacked U.S. national development team. He starred uh, for the USA at the under eighteen Worlds. He'll attend Boston College in the fall, and he has a real head on his shoulders. Thoughtful, engaging and analytical in his answers, the former New York Junior Ranger spent some time with Woody and Hutch as he prepared for his draft day experience. First off, Spencer, thanks for joining us amid what I can only imagine is a pretty crazy week. Um, What's this been like after an entire season leading up to this, the last few days heading into the draft? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's a good season and... Honestly, you know, the end of the year, you know, you think about the draft a little bit. And it's kind of in the back of your head. Whereas, you know, time goes by and it gets closer, you kind of start to, like, think about a little more, a little more, a little more. And then once the season ends, it's kind of like all you're really thinking about. So, What's the what's the process been like since the season ended? I mean, draft combine is one. I imagine teams have flown you in for separate interviews, not asking you to reveal who, but... What what's that been like for you going through it for the first time? Were there guys you leaned on to sort of help you get ready for this? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, obviously the combine and get all the all those interviews and stuff, and those are always good. But I mean, it's been a uh, yeah. I mean, it's a lot of a lot of interviews and lots of questions. But I think for me, you know, throughout the year we've kind of you know got gotten used to the sort of media sort of thing and all that kind of stuff just by just doing it so much that it just becomes, you know, like you almost don't even think about it. You kind of just go in there and just, you know, not really thinking about it. Okay. So let's, let's, let's switch gears then rather than being the media that asks you the same questions that everybody else is, let's get into the goalie stuff. Sure. Yeah. How'd you get started? How, like we all tend there tend to be common themes in terms of how we all fall in love with the position. What was it for you? Yeah. So for me, uh, you know, I played player growing up for a little bit, and, you know, the goalie gear was always, like, I thought it was really cool. You know, the pads, you know, the helmet. I thought those were really unique, unique, and I also, I didn't like changing on player. I like stay on the ice, so I was kind of like, oh, there's only one way to stay on the ice the whole time, so, I mean, that's goalie, so. Yeah, between those two, but, yeah, the equipment definitely helped me get into it a lot. What, sorry, what age was that about that you got started in goal? Yeah, so uh, I think I was around between 8 and 10, I think. I played, like, both for a little bit, like player and goalie. I would play, you know, forward one day, and a couple days later, I'd play goalie. Kind of just rotating, but, I mean, it was between 8 and 10. Yeah. Who who did you look up to then? Who was who were your favorite pros? Who were your favorite teams? What did you dream about? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so young when I was younger, I mean, I grew, I grew up, uh, I still live here, but I was, like, 40 minutes outside New York City. So... You know, growing up, I was a big Rangers fan, and obviously Lundqvist was the guy, and, you know, he's obviously a pretty elite goaltender, so I grew, grew up idolizing him, so. Now, did you, he's also a pretty u- unique guy from a style perspective. Did you, as a young Spencer Knight, were you emulating how he played in any way? Or that's, it's funny, because I'll never forget Cam Talbot saying, nobody can play like Henrik plays. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. That, um, yeah when I was younger watching him, I didn't really think about like how he played, but like, you know, yeah, there's no way I can really play like him. Yeah, how would you describe? Like, I mean, so many people are trying to do it right now, Spencer. Like your strengths, your weaknesses. Although, frankly, I haven't seen a lot of the latter listed. How would you describe your game and how your approach has evolved uh, over the years to who you are now, style-wise, as a goaltender? Yeah. So, for me, I'm a pretty technical goalie. Kind of, you know, a good sounding technique but you know, i think the biggest thing for me is you know the skating and also just the tracking too or two things to also rely on a lot and you know you gotta hold your feet nowadays and i also like to play the puck too so i try to balance you know athleticism and also technique so you it's you talked about playing the puck and obviously that's listed as a strength does that come from you know like you said you're you're into goal between eight and ten but there are some kids who are into goal even earlier than that or just never they never get a chance to play out. Um, does the puck handling come from playing out a little longer, or where does that where does that come from? Yeah, so for me, uh, so for me playing the puck, you know, it's not something I 
work on a ton. Like I, I do work on a little bit, but for me, it's been a lot of just, you know, the, you know, just going to take a play a player stick and going to the shooting room or just fooling around really is kind of where I think I got it from. And then the vision and stuff is just, I think I developed over time, but you know, for me, what helps also too, is I play, like when I play out, I play lefty. So it's the stick and the hand position is all the same. So. Do you still get a chance to play out? Yeah, yeah. I, I skate out every once in a while, maybe like a, like a little three on three practice, or if we're like just fooling around, pond hockey, whatever. So, yeah, I still get to get out a little bit, score some goals. Do you think that, other than other than going bar down on other goaltenders, which probably feels good, do you, th- do you think it helps? Like, we've had other guys over the years, like Holpe talks about that as well. The ability to read the game from being on the other side of it as a goaltender, being on the other side as a player helps you read the game as a goalie. Do you think that can, that like, was that something you tell young kids to try and do as often as they can? Yeah, I mean, for sure. I think, you know, I, I think jumping right into goaltending is, it's kind of hard. I think you should play player starting out and obviously rotate goalie when, you know, you're in your house league team, but, you know, playing player. Yeah. I mean, like, you know, you get out there, you kind of look at certain things. You're like, in like certain areas, like certain angles, you're like, wow, like these guys don't really have much to shoot at or anything like that. So, yeah, but yeah, definitely, you know, for young hits, definitely should get out and play player. And then when, when you transitioned to being a goaltender and then over the last few years, uh, who's been influential in your life? Who's, who's guided you uh, in your development as a goaltender? Who do you want to give a shout yeah. out to as we, you know? Huh. Yeah. So, you know, um, you know, obviously some big guys, I mean, uh, guys like Jared Wayman, he does a uh, pro crease goaltending and works for Quinnipiac. Um, he's been my goaltending coach, I think, since I was uh, like a long time. Like, I can't even remember. I was, it was, I was like almost basically when I almost started. So I've been working with him for a long time. And uh, he's kind of developed my you know, technique and foundation. And yeah, I mean, he, he's pretty much evolved my game. And then another guy like Thomas Spear at the uh, US NTP. I mean, yeah, he Spears, he's a great guy. And, worked with him over the past two years and developed a good relationship and you know he's also you know put some things in the game and helps me work on some things or you know kind of you know huge parts of my development over these past two years so both guys that we've had the pleasure to meet at various goaltending things over the years so not surprised to hear that they've had a positive influence on you um if you, can you can you give us an example spencer like can you give an like because your audience here is goaltenders right this is all uh, fellow goal, goalies listen to this. Like when you say things they put in my game, um, is there one thing that jumps out, say moving up to uh, the national team development program and working with Thomas? Is there one little element that you added a tool in the toolbox, so to speak, that maybe wasn't there before and walk us through that process at all, if possible. Like, is it a back and forth between you two? Yeah. So um, I'll give you one for both people. So perfect. A big thing with, yeah, so a big thing with Jared, he he like he he wants you know goalies like to hold their feet, you know, like as long as you can, right? Like try not to slide almost. And for me, that's been that's been like game changing, just because you know like I, I think that's a huge part of like where you know people are just defaulting to going down right away, and it's just it's not good. So he he's always like really emphasized staying on your feet, you know, getting there on your feet. So that's, that's a big thing with him. And then for, you know, Spears, you know, he, he came in, uh, I think in October of my 17 year. And, uh, yeah, I mean, we, we started working on certain things. We we're just trying to get to know each other. And then eventually, you know, we developed a bond. And then one thing he's also realized in this past, uh, past years, you know, taking a little bit more depth and kind of like not being, you know, so deep because I almost got so deep because I was reading the play so much. And he was kind of like, you got you know, just, just hold your depth on certain areas. And that's something I'm still working on today, but. Nice. Now, when you talk about holding your feet in patience, I think you're bang on. Um, huge part of the game now, especially as it gets lateral, as you'll find in the pro, pro levels, it's a lot of East-West. Um, and the ability to sort of read plays and beat plays on your feet is, is we hear that from NHL goalie coaches all the time, how important it is. How, how do you do it? Right? Like what's the, it's really easy for a, for a coach to say, Hey, don't go down, hold your feet, be patient. How did you, how'd you guys work through that? Are there drills that you felt help certain things that help you get to that stage where patience is a key part of your game now? 
Yeah, so obviously, I mean, uh, there are drills that you do do for it, right? And for me, what I found was a lot of practice, like, you know, just like not defaulting to going down, like almost just like in certain areas, just stay up all the time and just, and just get your muscle memory so you're not, you know, going down and then reacting, right? You want Exaggerate to react. Exaggerate really. Yeah, pretty much. And eventually, over time, what happens is it's just like you'll find yourself on certain shots and certain passes you know, you won't even go down if you know they're like where they're going. Like you just you're already you're staying up and it always becomes muscle memory. But, you know, for goalies to work on it, you know, jobs to just really like, emphasizing holding your feet. And like if you get beat on certain plays and you just you stayed up too long, it's like this that's that's part of the you know, the development process and you have to just keep doing it, keep doing it. And eventually it does and it's and it's really beneficial. So and if you're going to do that, obviously skating is is uh, so important. You've got to be a great skater. Exactly, how, yeah. how have you developed that over the years? Do you have any routines that you put into play each day? Um, you know, I wouldn't say I have any like specific skating routines. It's more just you know in practice, and just like almost reacting to situations. And I mean, we do certain drills, but there's no one area of the game where I'm like, you know, I have to do this every day, this every day, this every day. It's more just, you know, what are we doing today in practice? And, and whatever we're doing, it's like, that's how I get better. Because we also practice so much. So over the two years, I kind of just, you know, just do whatever in practice. And just, you know, obviously have those key three things that I want to work on that day and just try to accomplish those. So Does it help or can it be tough when practice includes... You know, like this is going to be an incredible, not just for yourself, but for the rest of your teammates from from the U.S. Uh, national team development program, uh, an incredible draft, an incredible day this weekend. Um, does it? How tough is it to to maintain all those patience elements when you've got the best of your peers shooting on you every day in practice? Or is that something you view as a positive? We've talked over the years with guys like Flower, uh, his time with the Penguins when it's Malkin and 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 Kessel and Crosby shooting on him. Is that how do you how do you approach that when you get to face the best every day in practice? Yeah, I, I think I think it helps. I think um, having you know good guys to shoot on you all the time is very beneficial. Like, you know, that's the thing. Our whole team is you know pretty legit, and they would yeah. all they're you know they're all they're all they're all, they're all they're all a threat to score. So, I mean. Yeah, having those guys, is, I think it's beneficial 100%, you know, in practice because, you know, every day it kind of keeps you on your feet and on your toes. And, you know, you have to be, you have to, like, be on your game to, you know, to succeed. You can't just get by in practice, you know, like kind of just going, you know, halfway, getting 50%. It's kind of like, I mean, if you're not in a game, you're going to get exposed, so. Do you, so many practices, so much of regular practice, we see it even at the NHL level, it's not necessarily conducive to goalies a lot of wide open shots and wide open looks and we've seen goalies over the years sort of hey that I mean it's this practice just isn't good for me but then we've seen other guys that find a way to embrace it as a chance to get better like how do you approach it when you've got you know Hughes and and, and Caulfield and all these guys coming in it's two on O looks in practice all the time do you do you, does that ever get frustrating or hey like this isn't realistic or how do you find a way to get better through that yeah, well, I mean, obviously, some drills are we very hard, and <laughs> sometimes it does get frustrating. I think just because if you're a competitive person, you know, you don't want to like get scored on really as a goalie. But for me, what I found like the biggest thing is obviously, you know, you can't really control the drill, right. and you know, you got to think you're you're on a you're on a team, so you have to do what's also best for the players, right? And it's sometimes not all be just about you. And you have, to, you have to realize that it's it's a team sport. It's not just one person. So, and also just taking, you know, just asking yourself, like, what does success look like in this drill? And it's like, it's say, for, for example, it's a two on O and, you know, they make one pass across, like be it on your feet, be square, be there. And if they, you know, if they go backdoor tap in after that, you know, you're, you're like, all right, you know, I beat on my feet. That's good. That's what I want to get done. So that's how I found what works for me is just, you know, asking yourself what success looks like in that one drill. So I think Spencer, we need to add something to the scouting reports I've been reading because wise beyond his ears seems like it's applicable. That's a, that's a great answer. Frankly, an answer that we don't, even at the NHL level, we don't always get. I, I, that 
that's awesome. An awesome approach to a tough situation where we've read a lot about the mental toughness for you, uh, ability to bounce back from one goal to the next. Is that something that's a conscious effort or where does it come from? Mom, dad, like, is it innate? Where, where does that element come from? Yeah. You know, for me, I think it's a goalie. I think, you know, if every goalie knows, you know, you know, you're, you're going to give up some goals and you're going to get a lot of goals. And I think that like, almost every time I gave up a goal, you know, like, you know, I, I used to get so frustrated and like, if I gave it one bad goal, it, was, it would linger for a little bit. But I think over time, after you, after you give up so many goals, like in practice, games just over time i think you just you just start to realize that like this you know beating yourself up doesn't do you any good it just like, i think that's for me that's what it's been it's just over time just beating yourself up just doesn't do you any good where's where's all this mental strength come from is it uh one of your coaches has been part of this is it your family um, uh love to know where all this you know, influence is yeah i mean they, you know my, my you know my parents are pretty relaxed people i mean they're never you know, on me. And I think that kind of translates to me just kind of being pretty calm, but I think just being, you know, being a goaltender, I think other goalies will know, like you just, you have to develop a thick skin. And that's why I'm also worked on very much. So just because it just, you see those goalies, like we saw in Jordan Bennington, Jordan Bennington this, uh, you know, this past year, I mean, it is how calm he is. And it just, it just, it's a good asset to have. And it gives your teammates confidence. And it also, can also, you know, if the, the opposing team sees you just calm after a bad goal you gave up, you know, they're like, all right, I mean, they don't think anything of it. You know, you're, you're not in their head. So I would say it just comes with time pretty much, I think. And uh, what were those car rides like home with, with mom and dad on your way, way home from games, good and bad? Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, they weren't, you know, they were never negative. You know, I think my parents understand that they're not coaches and they've never played goalies, so they don't know anything about it. <laughs> they I mean, my dad, you know, picked up some things here and there, and he knows quite a bit now. But he's never gonna tell me I have to do this or that, or you know, do this and this and change this in my stance or all that. He's he's just more supportive and just talk about it. Or whenever he's never criticizing or trying to critique certain areas of my game. Can we just take it back again to the to the skating? Um, one of the things people talk about with you is that you're very athletic, and we'd love to know. What do you, what does athleticism as a goaltender mean to you? Yeah. So for me, I think athleticism is, you know, it's a big part, a big thing, but you just can't always just rely on it. I think natural, you know, natural ability and, you know, hard work and athleticism is just something that you got to develop, you know, whether it's through skating or if it's through playing other sports, I think it's a big part for goaltending because, you know, there are times where there's going to be an awkward situation and, you know, that technique isn't just going to, you know, stop the puck. You're going to have to find some other way to stop the puck. And I think that's where athleticism comes into play. And how did you develop it over the years? Did you play a lot of other sports? Yeah, so I've, I I did play a lot of other sports. You know, for me, the big other one was probably lacrosse. I played a lot of lacrosse. And they played player in that. And, um, you know, running up and down, get to score some goals finally after the <laughs> long hockey season, right? But, uh, yeah, I mean, lacrosse was – you know, big thing for me, just, and I've always liked other sports and playing, you know, just running around and doing other things. I think that's, you know, something that all kids should probably do and not just be so hockey, hockey, hockey as a, in a young age, right? I think they should, you know, do other things and work different parts of their muscles. And... How long did you get to play lacrosse to? Because was there a point where it was, hey, you got to focus on the goaltending or did you manage to push back and stay a little longer in that sport? <laughs> No, yeah, I had to give it up uh, freshman year of high school, so it was, it was a sad day, but, you know, obviously I get it. it is what it is, but. I was going to ask you, too, we talked about playing forward. I wondered, like, lacrosse is, is also a game of patterns and movement, and, you know, whether it's Mitch Korn talks a lot of, with us about um, goaltending being about connecting all those patterns and dots and being able to identify them. Do, do you think lacrosse helps from that standpoint, the way the play moves around? Yeah, I mean it's it's a constantly moving. Everyone's always moving. You're always moving, similar to hockey, right? And I think it, you, if for you to think it out, like you know, it just you're just naturally doing things. Like you're, you know, where this guy's going, where this guy's going. That just works, you know, your in your IQ, right, or whatever it is. I think, uh, but yeah, I mean, like you said, like like Mitch Korn said, or whatever. It's uh, reading those patterns and just developing and just reading the development of a play and see where it's going. I think 
doing it in like a different sport helps you just be more natural at it when you get to hockey. The other part of the athleticism is, uh, you know, we all read the reports that you, you kind of killed it at the combine. Um, not just among goaltenders, but up there with the top players, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, yeah, how much of that is just the work ethic and the time in the gym, uh, you know, with the national team development program or, and how much of that is just that just innate. And like you said, from playing other sports in terms of, you know, the power, um, that you showed off in things like the, the, you know, some of the jump drills and things like that. Yeah. So, you know, I think, um, yeah, I do, I do take pride in the off ice training. Um, obviously we worked out a lot of, with the NTP and, uh, it's good to get some workouts like that in season. But for me, you know, in the off season, um, once the season's over, I do take, uh, some time off from the skates. I focus on getting into the gym and in the summer I go to this place called Prentice hockey performance. It's uh, like 10 minutes from my house. and You know, it's, it's a great gym and I, and they've, I've been going there for a bunch of years now and they've really developed me in terms of how that strength and power and just being an athlete and a pro off the ice and nutrition, and the way you handle yourself and stretching. And I mean, I give them a lot of credit for all that stuff too. You'll have a lot of time at the next level too to to you know that's one thing we hear about about college hockey. Obviously, you're headed to Boston College. I think I think if you're going to Boston College, I haven't quite figured out how this is going to work in terms of where they're picking. But if you're going to Boston College, that I think that means you have to become a Vancouver Canuck this weekend. Isn't that the rule? <laughs> oh no! <laughs> I right, we got. We, I mean, I've had Schne- Schneid's come through here and uh, gotten to know him pretty well. We got we got Thatcher here now, like. Uh, it's a na- it's a natural progression. What what was that choice like? What was the decision like to go to BC? Yeah, so B- in BC, I mean, it's a great school, and I think Boston being a great hockey town is also pretty cool. But I think the biggest thing for me, you know, the coaching staff is you know is amazing there. Um, the big one for me is like Coach Ayers. I mean, assistant coach, and also you know goalie coach too. And having him there all the time is you know it's very good. So, I mean, he's a great guy, too. So, I'm looking forward to that. And, I mean, also their track record of goalies, you know, kind of like you were saying. I mean, Schneider, uh, Demko, and Joe, Joe Wall is just there. I mean, all great right. goalies. So, just just for the, uh, you know, for the youngsters listening or for the parents listening, I'm curious, uh, when when did that decision start happening for you? When did you start talking to schools? When when did you get a chance to start thinking about college? Yes, for me, I, and I was pretty young. Um, I was uh, pretty much a freshman in high school, but I think I think they put in a rule now that you can't do anything until junior year. I'm not sure. That's yeah, right I think it's that. it is later for sure. I, th- I think yeah. I know they did, I know they did in lacrosse where they, you can't recruit before like junior year or something. I'm, I'm not sure about hockey too, but I think you know that process. It's it's a cool process. I think you just gotta you know really think about it and think it out and just take the you know the actual things that matter into consideration and. You know, obviously BC for me, great fit. So, what are you going to study? Uh, I'm going to be in the business school. Um, other than that, I haven't really set up my classes or anything yet. I think we do that orientation. Hey, I wanted to get back last last couple of ones, but I want to get back to the gear. You talked about that being your first love. So, Vaughn guy now. Um, we've seen it change over the years. Sometimes guys are just dialed. Like they know every spec. Sometimes guys get their specs dialed and then they don't change it and they almost forget what they're in. Where are you on that spectrum? Are you like a, are you a gear geek like some of us or are you more just, Hey, they build it and it works. No, you know, I, I do like to know what I'm wearing and, um, I do like to look at other things and, you know, for with Vaughn, it's been, you know, I can kind of, it's been a good, good uh, collaborative uh, work. I mean, for me, I, it's like I don't like to change if I know I don't like. I have to if I'm gonna change to a different gear, like a uh, different like break in a glove or something. Like I have to like use it so much, so it's hard for me to get out of gear. But I do like to look at everything, you know. So like for example, like me, I'm not the uh, Vaughn has the SLR two, and for next year, I'm just gonna stay in the SLRs. The regular ones I wore this past year, just because I I haven't really had enough time to wear them, you know. And it's for me, yeah, I'm definitely a gear geek, but uh, it's yeah, I'm I'm very finicky about my gear though. 
So do you, so growing up, like, was there a set, like we've, I mean, right up to the NHL, you'll have that story where a guy's like, you know, I was playing at a certain level and then all of a sudden Christmas or something, or one year where all of a sudden I got a pro level set or something unique that just, you know, took it to bed that night. Do you have a, do you have a gear story where there, there's a piece of equipment that either cemented that love for the position or even like, Hey, this is legit. I'm, I'm big time now. I've got the real gear. When I was young, I can't remember what set it was, but I think it was a pair of like, it might have been the Reebok Revokes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think I think it was those. I think I like slept in them one night when I got them. I think I, think, I, think I got those for Christmas too. So I, those were like, you know, those were like the one on the pads. I was like, oh, God, that's sick. <laughs> yeah, but those, those were cool. And then also, I think another cool set that was like my first actual custom set with my Vaughn. Um, a pair of Vons for um, Avon Old Farms and did the sock graphic. And I thought those were, those were like my first custom set. So I, was, uh, I took pride in those. So there, it doesn't matter what age you are or what level. There's something about seeing your name on the side of a set of gear, eh? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I was like, yeah. I know, right? Yeah. Really cool. Speaking of Avon Old Farms, same school as Jonathan Quick. Uh, have you had a chance to connect with him over the years? Yeah. I've talked to him a couple of times. I mean, you know, he's obviously a pretty busy guy, and I mean, I see him around the gym sometimes. But yeah, I've talked to him a couple of times. <laughs> Slightly different style. <laughs> yeah, just just a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Do you watch guys? It's one thing I remember talking to. Uh, it was Thatcher when he when he was drafted by the Canucks, and he used to keep a journal. Watch, he'd watch Game Center live, and he'd keep a journal, and he'd make notes on different approaches he saw from different guys in the NHL. And Hey, that might work here for me. That might not work. Like do, how much do you watch what other goalies are doing and maybe not even necessarily trying to emulate them, but you know, monitor the styles of other guys at the NHL level, as much as you're your own goalie. Do you, do you pay attention? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, for sure. I, I definitely do watch goalies in the NHL. Do you, is there a favorite? Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I like, um, like Bobrovsky and Vasilevsky. I think they're post play, you know, Legit. Same with um. I actually really like the Corpusalo. I think his skating is, you know, he's a really good skater. But uh, obviously, you guys like Price and Freddie Anderson too. But obviously, just great goalies all around. So, it's interesting you say Corpy uh, because you, you know you talked about patience, and that's a like to me when I watch him. And this, I you know, I can tell you, I know this was a bit of a battle sometimes with his patience on his skates off the release. There would be pucks where they would go through or underneath him. They would just, they would beat him low. And it was the, the coaching staff would say, oh, you can't give that up through you. And the goalie coach would say, listen, like that's the price of his patience. And I will take the patience over the odd one that goes in that way every time. So it's funny, funny to hear that you like him because that's definitely a part of his game. And that's part of that battle. Like you talked about in practice where, you know, Hey, there are some that are going to go in, but you have to stress the patience. Yeah, you definitely, yeah, that's for sure. I mean, you do have to trust the patience because, you know, next thing you know, you're going down early and then you're getting beat over your shoulder. And then, you know, then everyone's saying, why don't you stay up all the time? So, I mean, you obviously have to pick and choose in your battles, but I think, yeah, definitely take the patience. I mean, it's definitely the way to go. Spencer, I know we got to wrap up here fairly quickly because uh, you need to head out our way fairly soon, but, uh, as you're heading into the weekend where for, for many kids, it's a, it's a day to realize a dream. Uh, what would you say to a, a nine year old, a 10 year old goaltender? Um, just a little bit of advice as they head in on the same journey that you've been taking. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, honestly, if you're a young kid, I think for me, the biggest thing is just really enjoy it, you know, take it all in. I mean, it's obviously, I mean, looking back on it, it's easier said than done. But if you can really try to do that, I think just enjoy it, take it all in and, you know, have no regrets and work hard. I think those are the things that like you can almost apply to everyone. And that's something that, you know, I, I hope like any, any nine year old or 10 year old can do is just enjoy the game. Cause I tell you, as long as that passion's there, I mean, you're going to be playing hockey. So well said, well said, Spencer. We can't thank you enough during such a busy week for taking so much time. We're sorry we pushed it, um, but we really enjoyed the conversation. We're looking forward to catching up with you in person out here in Vancouver at the draft. Um, and we'll, we'll wish you best of luck in that draft, and we'll do it again when we see you in person. But thanks so much. We, like I said, just 
a great conversation and we really enjoyed it on this end. I know our listeners will too. Thanks, Spencer. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for having me. I mean, it's always good to talk to some goalie guys. Doesn't doesn't sound like a teenager. Have to be honest. I know you, you guys did the interview, and uh, and I got to listen in. That sounded like somebody much older than eighteen. Hutch. Oh yeah, didn't he? And and I just love the advice from practice talking about two on O's. How many kids would you, would you just love to play that for? It's uh, just yeah. absolutely perfect about mental approach to the game, about your role on a team. Uh, it was it was it was absolutely perfect you know what and what i loved is we're just talking goaltending with them and the answers just felt like a conversation like those didn't like a lot of the times you'll see these kids i saw it at hockey canada at the poe there was an intro and an extra interview and part of it was you know talk about your season uh, how do you think it went your role versus the team's role and those answers a lot of times feel like almost, you know, for lack of a better term and with all due respect, agent speak. Like there's a specific answer that they're supposed to give, um, much like a combine situation where, you know, you, you're kind of speaking the way you're taught to speak. That's not what I heard there. I just heard a kid who had a real thoughtful approach for the position, a love for the position, uh, and a mature approach to the position. And it, none of it came across as sort of pre-programmed, this is the answer I'm supposed to give. Uh, it just felt like a conversation about goaltending that, you know, quite frankly, impressed the hell out of me. And he is one of the followers of In Goal Magazine. And we think he's going to be the the first goaltender selected, but you're willing to go a step further? Yeah, he is now. He's got the In Goal bump, right? Like, hey, like we talked about Jordan <laughs> Bennington winning the Stanley Cup. If you checked our social media, you'll note that it was preceded by a picture in an In Goal workout t-shirt um, with the youngest member of the In Goal team. Uh, Mr. Matthew Hutchison. So, like, once you have the in-goal bump, you're gold, man. So he's, like, I'm calling it right here. We'll put some odds on it. Um, pretty safe bet, to be honest, guys, with the teams I talked <laughs> to. He's going to be the first goaltender off the board. Um, could be one of the highest picks we've seen in the last 10 years from a goaltending perspective at a time when teams are, you know, frankly, I think, unnecessarily afraid of the position. He just checks a lot of the boxes, and I think there's a lot less fear or worries about his upside um, than there are compared to some of the other names who have been in his position as that quote unquote top ranked guy in the past couple of years. We should have that conversation one day. It would be a nice one to expand out about the validity of picking a goaltender early in the draft. It's uh, it's always yeah. driven me crazy because we know that the odds of a right winger or a center or a defenseman panning out after the first half of the first round is is no better than a goaltender. Um, but at the same time, we also know that, uh, you can't really hide a goaltender on a team and well, you can I, give a, you can give a winger time to time to develop, uh, and you can, but, and you can't miss on a goalie draft because you only pick one. So, well, I think it's also the timing is the thing too, right? Hutch that top, top half of the first round right now, you're looking at guys that they hope can step in. If not the first year, then the second That's year. It. and yeah. with a goaltender, you know, Spencer Knight's heading to Boston College, right? Like, that's yeah. a good thing for his development because it gives him time. And it, and it gives him more time to get to where everyone thinks he'll be, number one NHL goaltender down the road. Um, but if you draft a forward at 10 or if you're the Canucks at 10 or in that top 15, there's chances are good you're getting a guy, you know, if not this season, and increasingly it's this season in that end of the draft, then certainly by the next season, you're thinking he can play. They all they, they won't all, you're right, but um, it's not just the hit and miss. It's more the time frame window, I think, for teams that uh, 
that leads them to back away from goaltenders. And it's it's spectacular misses as well. Um, and guys like Jack Campbell, who we thought was going to be a spectacular mix. What what was he, 2011? Top 10 pick? 11th pick? Incredible. Like, was was going to step in and have the most uh, extensive career, right? And and now he looks great. Like He might. It yeah. just it just took a different organization, frankly, a different voice um, from a goalie coaching perspective in Dusty Emu, who we talked about last week. And now it all looks like it's starting to click for him. But, you know, not many teams are willing to be as patient and, and wait that long. And there's a guy that, you know, for a while looked like he wasn't going to pan out at all. So it's yeah. uh, and it's tough. I, I originally wasn't talking about the top 15. That's a really interesting point you make about timing. Um, but, you know, you've also hit another bugbear for me, which is how often we hear in the media people panning a, a, an organization's ability to draft when the reality is it's the organization's ability to both draft and develop. And right. Campbell's a perfect example of that. Yeah, Paul Maurice Winnipeg was talking so much about the challenges of drafting and developing at the same time mm-hmm. uh, and, and not being putting that pressure to be competitive. You still have to develop uh, as you go with, with young talent. And then you add in a goaltender who's 19 or 20 years old and, and where they fit into it. The immediacy, though, of a top 10 pick and the pressure to put them into your lineup right away has uh, risen probably 75% in the, in the last seven years. So it's uh, that's that's probably the biggest reason. Knight is right on the edge, 32 uh, for a ranking. So he's 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 right on, uh, on the edge of, of a first-round pick. How would you describe his style or his game, Woody? Um, there's a balance, I guess, is the word yeah. I'd use. So actually, to be honest with you, I wish I'd, you know, I've only done probably 45 minutes of video. I haven't looked at as much. I do find the hard part with looking at, like, the, it's easy for me and the POIE guys that were at that camp last right. week because I got extensive look in situations designed to show you specific things in terms of the drills. I find a lot of the video on the other kids in the draft are highlight reel videos. And highlight reel saves are quite often um, saves that even the goaltender themselves would be like, oh, like they're highlights for not the right reason. He has that ability to go outside of the box and be spectacular. He beats a lot of plays on his skates and seems to be set on plays early, which is which matches what he tells you about with his patience. I think matches some of the anecdotal stuff you hear from scouts as much as I hate it when they make comparisons. But, you know, the comparison we hear a lot is price in terms of that balance and that ability to beat plays and be set and always sort of look like you're moving at your own pace and still always there. You're not chasing. Um, so I don't see a lot of chase in his game. It'd be interesting to me to see what happens with his glove position. Uh, if I was to super nitpick one thing that I think would probably have to change at the pro level, he's got a sort of Hellebuck-esque, uh, really low, almost just down by the shins in terms of how low he holds his glove. Uh, it works for him. He projects it forward nicely. He stays on pucks. Uh, he cuts pucks off out in front with it. He doesn't seem to get sniped up high because of it at this level. But then ni- neither did Connor. And once he got to the NHL, whether it was real or perceived, shooters thought there was something there. Goalie coaches thought there was something there because of the low glove and the tendency to chicken wing. And if you give shooters something they can aim for or think they can exploit, even if the save percentage might be not outside of what you know, another goalie has in the high glove. If everybody's going there and pucks start getting routed there all the time and they start going in there, that's something you have to change. And so it'll be interesting to me to see if that hand position gets changed on him as he moves and evolves through pro. Just because we've seen it, I think Hellebuck's a good comparable there. You know, one of the few guys I've seen that sort of holds it as low as Spencer, but all the tools for sure. And to me, it's the athleticism people talk about and yet, he doesn't have to go to it as early as some other goalies. You have to compete. You have to be able to make those types of saves. Um, but I want a guy who goes into goalie nine one one on the third or the fourth save, not the first or the second. And I think he's very good at that. Yeah, I, I, I'd nine argue one he one. goes to the athleticism early, and that's what makes him look so calm. Um, I think your description of goalie nine one one is a better one. It's the athleticism that allows him to be who he is. But what what's interesting for me about this one is a theme that we've had in conversation over the last year, two years, uh, amongst ourselves with scouts in the game, with goalie coaches in the game, 
uh, is talking about a player's ceiling or a goaltender's ceiling and uh, people shying away perhaps a little bit from highly technical goaltenders because perhaps they're already developed uh, as to the extent that they ever will develop and uh, a desire to look for that raw commodity that you could develop and turn into something something greater and yet here's a here's a young man who describes himself as a highly technical goaltender i think we see as a fairly technical goaltender uh, maybe bucking that trend that has been coming forward well, I, and that's a good thing. And we could probably get like, if we want to talk Agreed. about how goalies are evaluated, we could probably be here for an hour because there's another guy. I'm not going to name names. I don't want to call anybody out, but there's another guy that I've seen on the top 10 list. And you're right, Hutch. When I say athleticism, I mean desperation. Because, I know. Because yeah, that's, sure. that's how other people see athleticism as a goaltender. Yeah. But you're right. To me, it's the ability to be an athlete in terms of controlling your body, connecting your movements from your head through your torso down to your skates and arriving in one piece. That's what true athleticism is. And it looks boring. It's the sprawling goalie 911 that other people hashtag with athleticism <laughs> and, and cite as athleticism that uh, you're right. He doesn't get there. He doesn't have to get there as early as others. There are guys that I've seen in top 10 of this draft list that are in that mode in goalie nine one one on the first save before the second save. Like it is, I can't find a lot of good things, frankly, when I watch their game. And then I read the scouting reports on there and it's like, that's all they talk about is his athleticism. It's like, well, guys, guess what? Tell me why he needs to be in that mode so early. Um, because I'm pretty sure there are other faults and maybe, 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 Hey, there are goalie scouts and they're, increasingly organizations that give a guy like say um, for example their development coach in Pittsburgh Andy Kyoto they give him rain to spend the time to dig in on these guys there are organizations like the Chicago Blackhawks who hired Dan Ellis uh, as a goalie specific scout to dig in on these guys but there are still too many organizations that have non-goaltenders scouting these guys I've seen the reports I'm not talking out of my ass and they are laughable in the predictability with which they describe a goalie who's out of control, uh, the catchphrases they use. You know, on a good game, it plays big. On a bad game, it plays small. There's no understanding of footwork, how they control the box uh, in terms of shutting down the box in front of them that act, the puck accesses the net through. Just a genuine lack of understanding. It's getting better. But I look at some of these reports on these guys, and again, like, not to, I guess I've gotten on my soapbox. It's too late. They're laughable. Like they're joke. When we talk about mistakes being made with goaltenders, it's garbage in, garbage out. It's the same as analytics. Some of the reports I see are nothing but garbage. So how do you expect anything but garbage results if that's what you're using to analyze these guys? Like praising a guy for making a save that looks spectacular, that 10 other guys make look routine, and you cite that as a skill. Maybe, again, there are some goalie coaches that see it and say, Wow, like he had to go to there way too early. But if I can, he has that gear. If I can get it so he doesn't have to get there as often or as early, I can fix it. That would be acceptable. But I don't think that's what happens in many of the cases of these reports. It's just a genuine lack of understanding. And guys that look spectacular when there's absolutely no need to sometimes end up going up these draft lists. And then I watch them play and I'm like, what? I'm at a loss for words, guys. Like, I honestly had a loss for words as to what some of these people see. Well, that's never happened. That's a complete lie. <laughs> <laughs> I was. I, okay, I stuttered. I wasn't at a complete loss. For, yeah, yeah. I stuttered. That, okay. That's five minutes without a breath, which you're qualifying as yeah. at a loss for words. How, bi- how big is that soapbox I just got up on? <laughs> you, you just went there, so I'm going to follow it up. And uh, at the risk of uh, of going off track here, we're, and we will get to our gear segment with Cam in just a minute. But Woody, of of the thirty one teams in the National Hockey League, how many scout goaltending and draft goaltenders, in a way that you think is appropriate or uh, respectful of the position and the importance of the position? You know what? That's actually a really good question, Darren. And I'm gonna be perfectly frank i'm not equipped to answer it right now it's actually okay. one of the things that i'm going to try and figure out this weekend with the draft in my backyard with a lot of these goalie coaches coming through i do think it's increasing dramatically and what i and and when i see teams dedicate a goalie scout i think that's a big part of it but to dismiss teams that haven't dedicated a goalie scout because they haven't isn't fair either i mentioned kyoto as an example 
Mm-hmm. Um, and he's only an, an example because we've had a chance to you know talk to him about it. Um, you know, there's there's free reign there. Like they really, he's the AHL guy, but also the development guy, and they let him dig in. Um, you know, uh, without knowing the full extent of how they do it, um, you've got Vegas. Dave Pryor has been at the Hockey Canada POA in person each of the past two seasons, all three days, watching tip to tail, you know, watching these goaltenders, having conversations with the coaches. Like, like he's very hands-on and clearly gets time to dig into it. Toronto, as much as we wanted to maybe critique uh, and, and I did obviously the idea of cutting it off at six foot two. Um, the reality is, you know, they identify, they use analytics to identify goaltenders. And sometimes that probably identifies goaltenders outside of, you know, the, the usual scouting routes. And that's a positive. I do think a lot of times goalies get identified and they play on certain teams and the same group of scouts follows the same goalies to the same tournament, sees the same things over and over again and doesn't get outside that box. The Leafs use analytics to identify it. And then they let Brian DeCord really dig in as their dedicated goaltending scout and a guy who has, you know, immense experience and tons of respect throughout the industry for his ability to look at goaltenders. So um, it's not fair to say having or not having a goalie scout um, dictates where you are on that scale. And as I said, it is getting better. Um, but there are other teams that uh, where it is still lacking, um, where, they just let the regular scouts, without educating them a lot on the position, pick a list of names, and then the goalie coach digs in on them. And I've had calls from goalie coaches in that the, that fit that mold, where they're like, "Help! I there is not a single guy on this list that I like. Do you do you know anybody?" And one of them got drafted and played on Canada's World Junior Team that wasn't even on that team's list until a conversation I had with them. Because he wasn't one of these kids that was in these tournaments. He was a late bloomer. And their scouts had missed him completely. And so that happens still too often. But I tell you what, this weekend with a chance to have everyone in front of me and have conversations, uh, you know, on and off the record, which usually helps, let me dig in a little bit. In the next couple of weeks, we'll have a firmer answer for you on just how that percentage looks um, in terms of what teams are really doing the due diligence. And then the other part is whether it works or not. Because just because I think it's important to do that level doesn't mean it always pays off, does it? So you may have somebody, you know, there may be some scouts out there that I've disparaged um, by inclu- lumping them into a group of people that don't understand goaltending that have a hell of a record drafting good goaltenders. So you'd probably have to look match what we think is doing well to the results they've had. And just because guys are climbing up the draft rankings right now in the media uh, doesn't mean that's what the teams are going to do on draft day. That's uh, something coming out from Central Scouting. It's something coming out in various media outlets, but it's not necessarily what the teams are thinking. That's a good point. Yeah, and especially the Central Scouting thing, and I'm probably too hard on them a little bit. They do have limited resources. I've said it before to you guys. Even with European goalies uh, playing in North America, being included on the North American list, and obviously Mad Sogart, Danish goaltender, but he's in North American's group. He's listed as a North American goaltender because he plays in the dub. Even counting those guys, there's no way, there's just no way that the ratio out of this class is going to be, what is it, 36 or 37 listed in your, in North America and 12 in Europe? Like, I think the Europe that, that ratio will end up skewing towards Europe more, which tells me they haven't looked deep enough in Europe, but that's not their fault. They have Again, there's limited resources. You only get to see the certain tournaments, so you're not digging out that junior B late bloomer uh, in Sweden. And listen, we could get into size, because if we're cutting it off at six foot two and six foot one just won a cup and it's not good enough, but we still see six foot seven and six foot eight as a positive when really anything outside of six three, six four on either end of the scale, you have to overcome elements of your size. The, the six footer gets ignored because he has to overcome being smaller, but there's challenges at six five, six, 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 seven that you have to overcome. But the square footage gives them the benefit of the of the doubt that the other guys don't get. So we can have a whole other argument on that. Maybe we'll save that for next week. Yeah, because right now you're speechless. <laughs> uh, we'll slide over to our gear segment, and it's uh, one of the most awkward items to to ever try on when you're shopping. Like the pads, that's cool. You grab a glove, a blocker, it's awesome. The mask you can look at. Uh, the chesty, the chest and arms. Uh, it's it's also a really difficult piece of equipment to transition into from your old one to your new one. Yet it's generally speaking, 
while it's important, it's just kind of there. In today's gear segment, Woody and Cam detail the Bauer 2X chest and arm. The Bauer 2X Pro chest and arm. Welcome back to the Hockey Shop Source for Sports. We're in the basement, better known as Goalie Heaven, the goaltending department with Cam Matwiv. Um, before the store opens today, I don't have to hide in the storeroom. We're out in the open. So it means I get to just do like the full 360 pano of literally hundreds of gloves, masks, pads. So we're going to have to start doing this in the early hours more often, Cam. It is like I'm getting the full Goalie Heaven experience here. I haven't had my coffee yet. Okay, that might be a problem. So I have to turn your <laughs> mic levels up. We've got Mellow Cam. Um, I think I know how to get you excited because for this episode, we're going to talk about the Bauer Vapor 2X Pro chest protector, chest and arm unit, however you want to say it. Um, this seems to be one. We haven't, you know, full disclosure, in goal has ours on the way. We're a little behind in the testing procedure. Um, but based on the feedback we're seeing from others, from you at retail, an exciting product. Tell me what it is that's making this one jump out for goaltenders and jump off the shelves early in its life cycle. Uh, now you have uh, injecting me with a little energy here, actually. Better than coffee. The Bauer <laughs> Vapor 2X Pro Chest Protector. Better, better than, than coffee. coffee. <laughs> so... Uh, a bit of a, re not quite a redesign. They're still using a similar process than they did to the One X. So when you put the two together, you're still seeing a very similar shape, which is important because I think they, they hit the right profile. Um, but one of the things they really wanted to work on was arm uh, adjustability, arm fit, and arm flexibility. Let's go back to the profile first because for, I mean, obviously when you say the similar to what they had before, that's the one X model. The one that I think before the regulations changed, a lot of people grew familiar with Andre Vasilevsky was using it at the NHL level. Um, when you say profile, define that for me. So just the shape um, that you see, you know, basically when you toss your jersey on, it's not necessarily rounded shoulders. It's a little bit of box to it, but it's not like a, uh, what would be the best way to describe it? You're not looking like your giant like football shoulder pads by any means or anything like that. It's a little bit more of a tapered fit, which we've seen the common theme happening um, with retail chest protectors, you know, like the Vaughn um, and the V8 or even the uh, CCM and the E-Flex. Um, you know, it's just been tapering the chest a little bit more. Um, and this still follows within that lines for sure. So a product that's designed to... Uh, like you said, fit a little more tapered, but the focus is obviously mobility. Correct, correct. And that's where I think this really shines, especially out of the box, and that's definitely that arm mobility. This is something that I, I believe Bauer's been you know, working to address in the, some of their past models and haven't quite hit the mark, and this year they've totally blew that mark out of the water. Set a new mark. A a exactly, exactly. You can put this thing on right away. Um, you can feel comfortable in it. The arms, you can sit there, touch your, the back of your head, scratch it, and things like that. Y you know, you're waving to your buddy across the rink, no problem. It it's it's extremely flexible it's extremely mobile and you know it, it really shines as a is a wonderful product off the wall okay so let's walk me through i interrupted you as you were talking through the arms and how they've fixed some of the adjustability on that or or improved i guess is the better word so it's a lot to do with just how they've um, attached the elbow caps um, and changed the actual uh, arm floater itself just to improve that flexibility one of the things you'll notice, you you don't see the Curvex composite on this unit as you did on the One X. It's still there. It's just they've hidden it underneath um, basically a, um, a layer of nylon just to create a little bit more of a traditional look. Um, that doesn't necessarily do anything in terms of for the mobility of the chest, but it still means that protection is there for you that you were looking and for. And for those not familiar, I mean, obviously we see it on their pads and in their other products, but the Curvex composite or the Curve composite uh, by Bauer is there. Is there basically their proprietary for lack of a better term uh carbon layer their carbon fiber that they work into their equipment for to add sort of protection and stiffness and impact sort of dispersion correct and you see that also on the 2s chest protector as well so um, just a little bit of a carry over here but one of the really nice features that has changed from you know last year to this year for example um the arms are actually um laced in so to speak but with a drawstring so you can easily uh pull the arm up and down to find that adjustment factor this is something you find a little bit 
tougher, especially when you get into the pro category, because you can't. A lot of pro chest protectors don't offer adjustability in terms of, say, growth sizing for whatnot. So, you know, say you're, you know, midget age kids, you're still growing. You know, you need a little bit of growth room inside your chest protector. We want to pull those arms up and the body up as much as we can, so that we can kind of let it out um, right. as you grow a little bit more. This chest protector is going to offer that and still offer that elite level of protection as well. So that, that's that's new. I've seen it. Um, the the CCM. Premier obviously had the Velcro tabs at the top, so there was some adjustability there, but I've never seen it done like this. Um, like you said, sort of almost like like doing up skate laces in terms of the string across the top, the connection, and then uh, you know a, a release at the top of it where you can kind of you can lengthen it quite easily by the looks of it, but once you have it fixed and secure, it's going to stay in place. So that's a nice feature. For sure. I think now you got me thinking about it. the only time I think I've really really seen it in something else for like sports equipment was like sk- uh, snowboard boots actually. Um, you said pull that drawstring and you bring that uh, slidey um, thing for lack of <laughs> a lack slidey of thing. It's got a slidey, slidey thing. thing. We it's like slidey, slidey thing. things. Bauer's good at slidey things. Two X chest protector with featuring the slidey thing. <laughs> Just like the pads, they're good slidey things. <laughs> <laughs> so now beyond that, now we're going to focus a little bit more on the body and the actual uh, shoulder floaters themselves. They continue with their uh, what they call their free flex shoulder floater. So um, the floater itself, for the most part, retains the same profile. As the 1x but if you noticed on the uh, basically i would say right at about rib slash armpit area um they actually changed the floater material to almost a bit of a fabric so that way when you're crossing your arms for example not that you really should be like sitting with your arms crossed by any means but in terms of you know getting your arms out in front of you for cradle save maybe exactly exactly they call it their free flex area which allows the the floater to fold over a little bit more and bring your arm across your body whereas a lot of some of the other chests on the wall they stay very rigid and it causes the floater to kind of bunch up and hit you in the face almost this allows that to flex forward and you to move forward so a little bit more of a natural body movement as opposed to restricting you and again, keeping in that theme that this is this is a unit that's designed with mobility um, in mind as, as sort of a primary goal. Exactly, exactly. You know, it, once again, this should be something that you try on off the wall and you should feel like, wow, I could throw this into a game and I should feel comfortable right off the bat. Have you had guys that have, like, I mean, we're, it hasn't been on sale for long, but obviously it's been available for a little while here. Is that the feedback you're getting from guys that have had it out? Again, we haven't had a chance to test ours. Yeah, exactly. I think it's echoed, uh, again, some of that same feedback. Guys are just, again, feeling comfortable, feel mobile right out of the box. Uh, personally speaking, I've had a chance to try it out when we did our uh, photo shoot for our 2X equipment. Um, I wore well, You were flashing some leather that day, so clearly that there was the mobility wasn't an issue for you. A little windmill old school out there. Exactly, exactly. We wanted to keep uh, free and flexible and you know keep that go flashing, right? Nice. Other features. Basically, we move on to the side of the chest protector. They continue with their um, easy adjust uh, fast strap, they call it. Um, This way, you don't have to necessarily chase a buckle when you're going to go clip up your chest protector. It's just a slide clip, so you loosen it uh, when you take it off, and then to put it on, you're just grabbing both sides and pulling it nice and tight. Um, on the front of the chest protector as well, you've got three extra uh, belly pads that um, you can Velcro it on and off. Um, you know, you can argue a little bit, the guy needs a little bit more length. Say he doesn't necessarily tuck in his chest protector, you know, he keeps those on. Guy that does tuck in doesn't need that extra length because he wants to, to integrate with his pants quite well. Um, just easily enough, Velcro's them off. Nice. And also, again, I would imagine a little bit too, maybe for that growing kid, as much as the arms are adjustable, the ability... You know, if you hit a growth spurt in the middle of your season, or chest protectors are, you know, we've seen it right up to the NHL level. Guys will use it for multiple years. They're not 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 like other pieces of equipment where it's replaced on an annual basis. You might be able to, with the ability to sort of lengthen that belly with those removable, adjustable Velcro pieces, might be able to get a little extra time out of this. Start with them off and then gr- add them as you grow through the torso and get taller is that an option as well exactly exactly i mean you hit it on the mark again there but it doesn't uh, happen often (laughs) there you go but one uh, other thing you actually uh, reminded me of on the arms um, and this is something quite neat, and you saw it a little bit in Vaughn chest pads, but uh, Bowers kind of picked it up a little bit, and it's this adjustable lace um, arm pad that actually goes underneath for your wrist. So what the goal here would be is that you're putting it on your glove side, so when you're using a fingers-up uh, glove position, you know, a lot of the times the chest protector just won't have anything on your underneath your wrist. So this is just adding a bit of a pad there just to create a little bit of extra protection. And it is adjustable, so you can switch it to the other side for you full wrong bullies out there. Full wrong. Like it. Nice. That's I, I was gonna ask you what that was. So that extra piece of padding 
Uh, anybody who's ever gotten in on the bare side underneath the wrist, it's just a little extra piece on the backside to uh, to help with that. That makes a lot of sense. So uh, overall, Bauer 2X Pro chest protector, um, profile's the same, mobility off the charts, uh, like the soft padding on the inside. Um, so protection and mobility is the focus, and it sounds like they've uh, they've done a nice job of kind of blending those two with this unit. Yeah, if you're looking for a flexible, protective unit right off the shelf, not necessarily the biggest unit, but one of the more flexible ones, if not the most flexible one in this kind of bit of a category, definitely check out the 2X Chest Protector. And you can, of course, check that out at the Hockey Shop, Source for Sports here in Surrey, thehockeyshop.com online, or if you've got any questions about sizing and you want to talk to Cam or the boys directly, call them at... 604-589-8299. We're going to have to have a radio voice off between you and Hutch because Hutch does the the listener question one where he goes into radio voice and you've got that one. So I think we'll like we'll, we'll, next next time we have a live event, next Tendy Fest, we'll have you guys go side by side for best best fake radio voice. Cam, thank you very much for doing this. Really appreciate it. Uh, next week, I think we're going to talk about some Warrior Sticks. So look forward to that as well. Sounds like a plan. Talk to you then, Cam. Now, you went out there, and you and Cam go through that process, and uh, it, it, it's fascinating because I make fun of you guys for, that we should have video because I, I just picture one of you with a microphone and the other one holding uh, a pad or, or, or the chest and arm. But what do you, like? I think there's a segment in here somewhere about how you properly try on uh, a chest and arm and get fit for a chest and arm, not just talking about protection, but because there's so much that goes into a piece that, None of us really think about that often. Yeah, you're right. And I think it'll probably be a good segment for Cam Hutch. I know you went through that experience recently at the hockey shop, fitting a chest and arm. And, and it's it's complicated, kind of like you can't just, you know, put on a set of pads without skates and figure out how they fit. you got to try another pieces and see how it integrates. Um, it's a very personal fit and feel. And the other thing is, you know, Cam, you've mentioned it. You can move your arms here. You can move your arms there. I, you know, I think... A lot of us try and do that test where we're sort of touching our head when we've got a chest and arm protector on for the first time. But in reality, other than putting your mask on that first time, you know, and we we saw this Hutch CCM showed us a bunch of research that they'd done on, on, Mm -hmm. you know, practical arm mobility, like the actual arm movements that you actually use in a game quite often don't relate to a lot of the sort of standard off the rack, put it on. How can I move my arms test? Like scratching the back of my head isn't something I need to do to make a glove safe. So, you know, it, well, unless you're posing for those scouts. Yeah, I, I do like <laughs> I, I, the windmill tech because I don't catch a lot of pucks out in front of me. Like you're supposed to, the windmill does end up behind my head. Go- the goalie time. nine one one, baby. Yeah. Goalie nine one one. Yeah. 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 The Gotta show rolls. that athleticism. That's right. That's right. Yeah, I know I found that research at CCM one of the most fascinating things uh, that we saw there. And it was one of those things that in retrospect, you look at it and you say, well, of course. And yet nobody's really done it until now. And that was looking at, as you said, practical range of motion. Uh, What different units um, are the most mobile when you're making standard goaltending movements? What's the range of motion for the motions that we want to do? And uh, yeah, like, very very interesting and something we could be doing when we're in the store think about that a little bit more before you make great judgments yeah and i, um, well, I just think I, I put myself in the position the times that uh, that i go and i buy new chest and arms and i i bend my elbows a couple of times like pretending i'm um, lifting my glove hand up or my blocker and I, I flap my wings a couple of times and i decide okay well that's that's good or or that's too big or that's that's i mean that that's what my the chest and arm process is for sure for sure but but so much is involved i mean that unit has to right. integrate with your pants more than which i never else. thought of do you tuck it is it outside how do you tie it down if you do are you wearing suspenders what's underneath those pants because you're probably trying on a different pair of pants in the store that you normally use uh mask mask as we increase and mask as well 100 as, as we understand the importance and we hear a lot of quote unquote tracking down as we understand the importance of being able to move the head down and stay on pucks you know if you got a thick chin on your mask and that 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 sort of chest or shoulder floater sticking out too far does it affect like there's so much that goes into it i think we've talked ourselves into a complete segment with cam on how we fit this and and that you mentioned i just wanted to mention hutch that the research from CCM was from Dr. Ryan Frain, the same guy yeah, that we've you. seen a lot of the butterfly drop velocity research from. 
Um, and it was fascinating and we'll be able to share you know, at least elements of that with our readers uh, over the course of this summer. So I'm really looking forward to that as well. Well, there we uh, we have one gear segment, and it's uh, and it's spilled over into another one. So that's uh, that's good. More work for Cam, which is uh, which I always enjoy piling on to, to him. Uh, last week you mentioned uh, Woody, just the goalie coach carousel, Dusty Emu. Uh, heading uh, to Europe, and what else do we have going? On? Uh, yeah, Mike Bales left the Carolina Hurricanes for the Buffalo Sabers, which was I kind of teased on social media or the in goal account teased on social media that there were more moves coming. That was the one that was public. Um, well, I guess not public, but the one we knew of that was not yet public, and it now is. Uh, interesting. Mike Bales, a guy who won two Stanley Cups with the Pittsburgh Penguins, and I think played a massive role uh, in rejuvenating Marc Andre Fleury's game. Uh, en route to those two cups, uh, was let go right promptly after the like the parade of the second Stanley Cup victory, which you know still kind of scratched my head on that one. Carolina gets him; he manages to help them to an Eastern Conference final with Peter Morazic and Curtis McElhenney in goal. Uh, still had term on the contract. Buffalo actually had to call it an assistant coach permit position in order to have it be. Oh. That's how you're able to leave resign from the existing contract and move on. Um, but Firm too. So that's, that's if you, you move to a higher position, right? You can usually most right. contracts permit. You can, it's not always. Cause I know of, right. for example, Kim Dillabaugh, who's now in Philadelphia, when he was with the Kings, he had an NHL offer and he was with the Kings in an AHL development role. And Dean Lombardi wouldn't let him take it. Cause it wasn't in his contract. But most times if you're in the AHL, you can move up to the NHL, NHL, the NHL is a lateral move, but by calling it an assistant coach position, um, and creating a position. That, and let's be honest, actually, you know, this is Scott Murray. Um, had him at Hockey Canada POE make a presentation, uh, you know, ab- about some of this, the stuff he worked with Holtby. But part of his job there is also how do we create offense? How, as we analyze goaltending and how goals go in, how do we create more of those types of scoring chances? And he used Stephen Valakett's data from ClearSight Analytics to cr- to basically help dictate a lot of how Washington attacked en route to a Stanley Cup. So the job has evolved, and that allowed Buffalo to evolve the name of the position, which allowed Mike Bales to leave Carolina. And I can be honest with you, I'm hearing that it might not be the only outflux of coaching talent talent drain uh, out of Carolina. I know the new owner there has likes to do things differently. Um, it sounds like that includes coaching and scouting, um, salary structure and asking guys to maybe take a lot less if they want to stay to be part of the organization. And if you're Mike Bales with his resume, uh, you probably don't have to, and you shouldn't have to, frankly, Hey, I'm always on the side of the goalies and the goalie coach, and I'm going to take that side here. Uh, what happens now? We'll see. Um, that is the lone vacancy in the NHL, although I've heard rumblings New Jersey may open as well as Roy Melanson has, has I'm, I have no confirmation there, but there's been talk in the past as he gets on in his career that he might be looking for a lesser role. And that talk continues again in New Jersey this summer. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised to see Paul Schoenfelder move up from Charlotte in the American Hockey League to Carolina in the NHL. Did a great job um, helping... Uh, Nadelkovic and Tokarski win a Calder Cup uh, in the American Hockey League. Really good young coach. I got to work with him at Hockey Canada POE uh, two years ago and was so impressed. Um, so it would be a natural progression for him to move up to Carolina, and that opens up that job. And the only other jobs left available are, I guess, L.A. is still looking, although I think they're leaning one way. I won't say yet. Um, with the Kings in the American Hockey League to replace Emu, if... Paul moves up to Carolina. The Charlotte job opens. And last but not least, we broke the news that Colin Zulianello would be leaving the Calgary Flames American Hockey League um, development position. I said family reasons. I had a couple of people text message me afterwards saying, hope everything's okay. Uh, so I should pass along that that it is. It's not a health thing. When you say family reasons, people worry. Um, just strictly a family work-life balance thing. Um, his wife's a doctor. Uh, she can't work in the U S as I understand it. And they have three kids under the age of 26 months. And so Stockton in the American hockey league and just geographically and for some other reasons just didn't fit for him. Um, so that job is open as well under Jordan Sigalette and the Calgary Flames. So tough loss, actually. Um, you know, you lose Dusty Emu, who's done such a good job. You lose him to the KHL and more money. 
and then now you you lose a guy in a in an American League development job who you know Colin Zulianel is a hell of a coach. Again, another guy I've had the pleasure to meet and see and, and learn some philosophy from, and I was really impressed. We know about the Thunder Bay Army as they as they've been called. Uh, Matt Murray, Mackenzie Blackwood, uh, Carter Hutton. As much as it doesn't get talked about much because Zuli's not a guy who talks about it, that's where that starts. Those guys all worked with him in Thunder Bay, and most of them still worked with him in Thunder Bay in the summers in the past couple of years. You've brought up the uh, program of excellence a couple of times. Uh, just uh, clarification on the Team Canada yeah. interview that we promoted. Yeah, I know, and, and my apologies to our listeners. Um, I teased that we were going to have the roundtable I ran for that camp. Um, ran into some permissions issues in terms of, uh, you know, it, it, it being young kids in a private function. Um, so we weren't able to run the interview. Unfortunately, we didn't want to risk offending anyone or, or, you know, or not do or doing, you know, frankly, it was really good stuff. It just, it just didn't have the right permissions in place. The good news is, uh, as much as that exact content dies on the vine, um, that round table, uh, the questions and the answers that came from the questions have all been captured. And so uh, the participants themselves will join us in one-on-one formats here at Ingle Radio in the near future. We got, we got Freddie Brathway teed up already. He'll be here at the draft this weekend. We'll catch up with him. Uh, we'll definitely catch up with Danny Sabrin in the near future because he is a hot rising name. Could be a name that fills one of those jobs I just talked about, actually, guys, in the goalie coaching right. world. Uh, and Jason LaBarbera is an absolute beauty. So we'll make sure all the stories that I promised that we don't end up delivering today, um, that we couldn't tell in the Hockey Canada Roundtable format in this format, uh, we're going to deliver them in this format in the near future in a one-on-one type environment. Listener questions. Hutch, uh, how do people get a hold of us? Uh, I believe that would be podcast at ingolmag.com. Darren? I had one sent directly to me via DM, and if you guys would indulge me and uh, and answer this question, uh, it's uh, sends uh, sends in and it says to the guys at In Goal, love the podcast. It's been uh, a great addition to my podcast uh, rotation. I especially love the host, and he's been a great uh, great ad. Uh, I was at Tandy Fest for the first time in 2019, just a couple of weeks ago. I got a chance to spend some time with Woody one-on-one. And while I appreciate his passion, his uh, knowledge, and his reach kind of screwed up my game a little bit. And I'm now in a deep slump. Uh, How do I get out of a men's league slump? Yours truly, Millard. (laughs) And and let's Woody? be clear that slump was created uh, in a By restaurant Woody. in Vancouver yes. with Woody on his knees amongst all the diners, uh, <laughs> demonstrating the proper use of head trajectory. This is yeah. once again to get back to the point of every time everyone asks me why don't you coach, Exhibit freaking A <laughs> is now Darren Millard. Or you could just watch me actually play. Um, I tell you to just look at the puck, Darren, but clearly that didn't help either. Dude, I like I was I was I was going fine, and the last three weeks I've just I can't do it. I I'm in this this funk slump, whatever you want to call it. On a, I'm uh, now uh, thinking I need new gear. A, that, that's that's that, what I'm now. That will fix it. But on a serious note, like that is honestly <laughs> why. And I've we've had this. Hutch, you've asked me before. <laughs> why don't you coach? The reality is, you have to be able. And this is where these guys that are teachers where I have so much respect for them. You have to be able to, right. it's not about knowing what's right or wrong. It's about how you present it and managing it and doing it in a way that doesn't create too much thought that allows them to still go out and play. And I, you know, I've had the privilege of not only being on the ice and watching them all work, but actually recording those conversations and then editing that video and then sort of trying to develop teaching tools that will roll out at in goal soon. Um, you know, through some of the pro camps we've been to and also teaching tools that Hockey Canada is going to use um, in a new curriculum we're working on. Seeing how those guys do it makes me realize, and, you know, as if I didn't know before, Millard has reaffirmed it. um, That's not me. (laughs) I I don't, that's, I I don't know that I'd be able to do it. So let the teacher in the room disagree with you a little bit here, Kevin. I've said before, I think he could be a coach and I still think you could be a coach. Just not Millard. Uh, no, well, you're you're criticizing yourself as if you're a teacher on the first day of teachers' college, not being a seasoned veteran. Um, 
you know, it takes practice. It takes experience to be able to communicate with your students. Your base of knowledge is unbelievable. And, yeah. uh, and I do think that you are a communicator. So you, you, you could actually get to be a, an excellent teacher. Yeah. Uh, Darren, though, I will also refer you, uh, to, uh, go back to our podcast with Stefan wait and, uh, yeah. listen to that carefully. Um, we do have a small problem as beer leaguers and that we never practice. Uh, right. so that's why probably why you're screwed up. But remember he talked about, uh, grooving in simple movements so that when the game came, uh, you could stop thinking and just perform. Whereas you having no practice time whatsoever, you are thinking all the time. I'm even taking extra warm up, like three pucks at a time, like beer league warm up. It's ridiculous, and I still can. <laughs> I think three pucks at a time might not be considered good extra warm up. <laughs> yeah, you, you should you should bring your gear this weekend. Get a little ice. Kevin, get some practice coaching. <laughs> yeah. You can get some practice repping it all out, and you'll be a genius. Right? Oh, oh, Darren, I should have had you. I got an ice time on Friday morning at eight thirty in the morning, buddy. We could have. Uh, we could have had a little. We could, oh yeah, we we definitely well, should have. It's you or a junior B kid I have to face at the other end. If you're struggling, I'd much rather have it be you. I'm uh, I'm trying to track down Marty Berder for a conversation for uh, In Goal Magazine and uh, In Goal Radio, the podcast. Uh, we'll get him out there and he can work with us. Uh, but you, you know, I love our conversation. I loved our conversation. It's just that I've I've tried to take it and put it into my game, and it's not quite there. I just I need a little more. A little more seasoned. You know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna take a page out of. I've got. I'll send you a present in the mail. I heard this story at Poe from Scott Murray, um, just to get you, just to relax you and get you relaxed. Uh, when Braden Holpe was struggling this season, um, mm-hmm. his dad sent him a present, and I guess the note on it was a very nice handwritten note about, hey, like I can see it's not going the way you want it to go. And this is kind of outside his dad's norm to write it like this way and, you know, just walking him through this. And I've got something here that I think might help. And Braden opens the present, opens the box and the present, and inside it is Jacques Plant's book of goaltending. Right. No way. And oh, just but and just to just to laugh, right? Just to like just hey, you yeah. know, like oh, that's hilarious. Like yeah, I guess it just had him chuckling and that. So maybe I need to come up with something this weekend that'll just get you laughing and not thinking Please. so much. And then we'll get you back on top of your game. Well, I'm very much looking forward to hanging out with you guys. And, uh, yeah, no reverse VH in that Jacques Plant book of goaltending. Uh, the Stanley Cup has been presented. The season is over. Congratulations to Jordan Binnington and company. The hockey calendar now turns to next season with the NHL draft. And while it's considered the first official event of the next campaign, today's feature interview was a good indication that the dawn of a new year may have to wait as night is casting a longer shadow. Thanks to Spencer. Cam at the Hockey Shop, and to you, the listener, please give us your feedback at your preferred podcast provider. I'm Darren Millard. Be calm, be focused, be a leader. It's all about the next opportunity. Until then, goodbye.